All right, everybody. So today we're going to break it down. I'm going to do kind of like a mini video here on women during the Renaissance. And we had talked about them a little bit uh, under like Italy and kind of day-to-day -day life and stuff like that. And, and so we see all these different scientists and artists and this or that. Like, did women have the opportunity? What could they do? What couldn't they do? And, and as I say here, it, it's just not easy. And, and one of the things that really show us the, the struggle that women had was the witch craze of the 16th and 17th century. Upwards of 100,000 women were tried for witchcraft. Um, the, the idea of witches had been around for, for quite a long time, and they were blamed for a variety of different things. And, and often, as was the case, um, strong-willed women or women that showed skill in almost anything typically skill and things that men, quote-unquote, were supposed to do, were often branded witches because um, those women could be intimidating and knowing, well, there's no way that a woman could possibly do this, that, and the other thing. But what really happens is that um, the church starts to link witchcraft with the devil. And there's going to be a lot of is issues with, like, sexuality and women's roles as um, tempting men and things like that. And what starts to happen is it just starts to like build and build and build until finally in the 16th and 17th centuries, you start to have people specifically go after women. Okay. Um, many were tortured. They were often forced into confessions and, and then you had the creation of the Malleus Maleficarum in 1487. This is known as the Hammer of Witches, as I see, as you see over there in the right. And this was a guidebook for identifying witches and how to torture them and then burn them and, and, and various things. Um, it's, it's just, gosh, it's just brutal. Um, now, were there some men put to death here? Well, yeah, there, there were, but by and large, it was women, and they were always targets, and in many ways, the witch craze, the witch craze was a way in which women were kept in check and underneath men throughout much of uh, the Renaissance period. Now, so who was a witch, and, and what was the impact? That's the whole idea. Like, well, how do they identify witches? And they, they would do all these sorts of of wacky things like you know here you see this woman being dunked and if she floated um like a duck then she must have been like a witch but a lot of times they would attach like heavy things to their um to their legs to make them sink like it was just crazy and and really any any woman or if there was an issue like say um, and this was very common. Say there were a number of miscarriages in a village. Well, they would assume that that was because of a witch. Say that somebody was acting inappropriately, uh, that would be a witch. Or people could use or blame people for being a witch to get away with bad behavior, you know, like, you know, the crucible. Go read the crucible. Um, and all of these things were very, very impactful, and it kept women kind of in their place, um... It would eventually die out, but the impact on, on women were was really, really tremendous in keeping them, again, in that lower rung of society. But then, like, maybe science comes along, right? And everything's going to be great. No, no, it, it's just not. Um, stereotypes are going to continue and actually be made even worse. I have up here, quote-unquote, sexual issues. What starts to happen is this idea that women are much more corruptible um, when it comes to uh, sex and things along that line, that they're easily swayed, that they're, quote-unquote, sexually insatiable, that all of these things are on women. And since you're not supposed to have sex before you get married, and there's a religious and moral things, so it puts women into this kind of view of immorality, which, again, has them as, as that group that needs to be kind of over there. And then you have science, which actually doesn't help. Um, in drawings of skeletons, women were often shown with smaller craniums, which meant they had smaller brains. That, of course, is not true. Um... They also, 
Oh, I didn't back up there. Well, that's okay. Um, they also had larger pelvic areas, which proved that they were only really meant to have children. Again, using science to, or corrupting science to make it say what you want it to say. And then with the increase of better trained doctors and surgeons, women actually lost areas of influence and in like being midwives and stuff like that, which took away from their skill set. Okay, and so by and large, it was in, going to be incredibly difficult for women really to achieve almost anything in this time period. But there were some women that would make a difference. Um, one of them to start is Mary Cavendish, who lived from 1623 to 1678. Um, she would actually get a, a couple different works published. Um, she was actually the first woman to ever attend meetings of the Royal Society of England and was permitted to participate in debate, but of course they would never actually let her in. And what she was really big on is she uh, attacked the idea that we could master nature through science in her writings. She thought it was very presumptuous to think that, that we could go and control nature. And so a lot of her writings focused on that, that, you know, that level was not really achievable. But also, she um, really went after Aristotle, which in many cases were correct. Uh, she writes about the mind and soul and mannered. Um, she wasn't a really big fan of the mechanical theory of the universe that we kind of talked about before. But she was very outspoken, and this is what would often turn people off. And that Mary Cabin just wasn't necessarily always right on anything, but it was something that she saw... Um, or, or that she was actually given a platform to do, which was really important. Um, and she's on the top left. On the right there, you have uh, Maria Marion, who actually is one of the top entomologists of the day. And that was really crucial, again, further understanding like nature and our place in it and different types of animals and bugs and stuff like that. And, and that was really, really important. But probably the most successful woman at the time was Maria Winkleman. Um, she actually was able to get an education. Her parents were not against it. And that's what it really come down to, guys. If you had parents that were willing to give you a break and give you an opportunity, maybe you as a woman would get a chance, but it was you were still beholden to them. Um, she did get a good education, and she actually marries uh, a famous and well-known German astronomer by the name of Gottfried Kirch, and she would work with him quite a bit. Okay, and she's going to be able to churn out quite a bit of work with her husband. Um, she will do things like she will create up-to-date calendars. Um, she will create statistical data and help create um, some of the world's first almanacs, which are very important for farming. But one of her big things was the discovery of uh, the comet of 1702, um, it gets named after her husband, and we really don't know why that he took credit for it. Eventually, he would um, he he would say no, she really discovered it, but they they kept it was known as Kirsch's comet still. Um, but this was the first ever comet discovered by use of a telescope, which is pretty significant. Um, but again, she doesn't get the credit for it. She actually tries to get into the Berlin Academy, which was, you know, Germany's version of, you know, the big time scientific society. Um, but because she was a, a woman, they just wouldn't let her in. Despite the fact that Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, if you remember, who was a co-discoverer of calculus um, and one of the greatest mathematicians ever, went to bat for her big time, and no one would let her in. Um, in the end, she was actually offered um, a, a job and, and a position in the Royal Academy under Peter the Great, but uh, she didn't want to leave Germany. And the fact of the matter is that, guys, though, unfortunately, that this is, this is rare. Um these women just weren't given opportunities. And as we know, well, for, you know, it's not that they're any less smart or intelligent, but the opportunities were not provided for them. And that's why it's going to be so much harder for women to have this impact. And we'll talk, and we've talked about the roles of women, and we will continue to talk about the roles of women to try to get some type of change going, but, it, but it's definitely going to be a while. All right, make sure you get your assignment done, and we will talk more in class.